I've never formally studied music, but just playing this red cedar flute and the traditional songs and the traditional instrument, people have experiences, they have reactions to it. They're drawn to it. Some people have even spiritual reactions to the song. And this is uh, the journey I've had with this flute and its music. Good morning from Sisseton, the home of um, Brian Akifa. What a peaceful way to start the morning with that video. Um, I'm Jane Rasmussen, and I am, am the director of the Sisseton Arts Council. And I also have the privilege of serving on the South Dakota Arts Council board and the Board of Arts Midwest. It's great to be with all of you this morning. And it's my distinct pleasure to be able to introduce to you our South Dakota Poet Laureate, Christine Stewart of Brookings. Christine writes at the intersection of experience and research to figure life out. This poet, memorist, professor, and mother of two is fueled by painting and sculpture, international travel, medical science, world history, and the tensions of our contemporary culture. Her readings and artist talks work and workshops aim to promote reading and writing and poetry across the state and beyond the borders. And we had the pleasure of being able to hear Christine last night um, as, as a member of the, the touring arts roster. So glad that you're doing that for people across South Dakota. So it's, um, it's a distinct pleasure to be able to hear you again this morning too. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. So I just wanna make sure that everyone can hear me. Jane, can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Okay, great. Last night we were having some troubles with the audio. So we've done some experimenting here at home. 
because I'm reading um, to you from my attic in Brookings today. <laughs> and I'd like to share three poems with you this morning um, from my two books, which I call the, the Twins, my two last poetry collections, because they are published around the same time. And I typically write pretty uh, serious poetry, at least with, with pretty heavy themes. But this morning I thought, it's morning, it's a kickoff, so let's try to have a little bit more levity. So I'll be reading three poems that have some serious themes in them, but also have moments of levity. Um, Blue Word's greeting is based on two things that have happened to me. And one of them is raising a child with a rare form of epilepsy called Landau-Kleppner syndrome, where language, where the seizures tamp down his ability to speak and use language. And the other part of the book is based on my experience with recurrent miscarriage. So the poem I'll read today, even though that theme is kind of heavy, does have some moments of levity in it. And it's called, when my OBGYN said he didn't understand poetry. I worried because my body is a more complex text. When he feels the shape of my uterus, he may not think pear-shaped, yet an apricot in size, hollow butternut squatch, light bulb. He may not consider it a bowl for a daughter developing inside with eggs for her daughters, a set like grandma's Tupperware poised to seal away meals, or nested like Russian dolls, copies waiting to be twisted off, revealed. My doctor speaks the body's language, Uterus tilted towards spine could mean incarceration, wombs snagged on the pelvic bone, almond-shaped ovaries pocked like plum pits, if swollen with movable lumps, could be dermoid endometrioma or chocolate cysts, or nothing, nothing to worry about. He questions structure, unpuzzles chromosomes, scrutinizes tensions between biopsies and blood work, and reads all this alongside testimony and history, because my flesh, like a poem, carries mystery. It produced one child complete, but jettisoned the next four. My doctor's blasting of my uterine purse, whether it will fill and stay full or remain empty, eludes his science. But when I build a nest of words, paradox and ambiguity kiss each time, offspring running down the page. And I am happy to say the last poem in here uh, foretells this birth of my second son. So I eventually did have that purse full and stay full. <laughs> so that's um, Blue Words Greening. And then the other two poems are from and Trust, which was published by the University of New Mexico Press. And the other one was published by Terrapin Books. And this one book is more about the dissolution of relationships. This poem um, called Evolution is one of my favorite poems to read because it starts with the prompt, look up from your computer and fall in love with the first thing you see. And so I fell in love with uh, my son's Tyrannosaurus Rex toy. But then it kind of turns toward the end and really thinks about what it means to evolve and what it means for people to evolve, what that could mean. Evolution. Dinosaur, I have fallen for your tyrant lizard ways. Lording over Triceratops and Stegosaurus up on the toy table, you strike fear into Darth Vader's heart. Han Solo escapes but Skywalker screams inside your pink painted mouth, your jaw unhinged, even as a toddler hugs your plastic back, tugs your graceful tails for a vertebrae. Tyrannosaurus Rex, last land dinosaur alive before asteroids fell, before volcanoes spewed liquid heat, before ash veiled earth in darkness. I love you not because of your 12 inch teeth, your seven ton ground quaking step, a heft inspiring chills in the crustaceous period's bravest hadrosaurs, but because you're misunderstood. Paleontologists lowered your top speed by 32 kilometers. Over conference tables, they slam down research and come to blows. Some say you are black bodied, redheaded, they are stink scared competitors away. Others mourn their predator king, ignoring the nobility of, what, of those who do what their bodies do best, be it three-toed theropod feet 
or four limbs of cortical bone? Does it matter if you held your prey immobile? If binocular vision and large olfactory bulbs mean you fed on the nearly or already dead? Under your smooth skin, the corded muscle, some of your bones were too hollow to hold your weight, but are hollowed to humans who study the story of your end. Do they see you, my dearest T-Rex, in the Andean condor? Black feathers spanning 11 feet and soaring, even at 26 pounds, to dine on whale, llama, alpaca? How time limits us. If only we evolved like you. Instead, we wait for that spark of surety for our gods to give us wings. And then um, this last one is, uh, hold on, just, um, this last one is called Crush. And I know that when Jane uh, introduced me and thank you, Jane, for that introduction, um, it, my bio talked about travel and I love to travel. And so this pandemic has been really a challenge for, for me. Um, and this next poem called Crush uh, is based on visiting Moscow and Russia for a couple of weeks, uh, several years ago and touring the Pushkin Museum. And I didn't really know a lot about Alexander Pushkin who is a Russian poet and all he's everywhere in Russia. There's all these statues of him everywhere. But after going to this museum, I kind of fell in love with him. And so this poem is, is a fun kind of falling in love with and Alexander Pushkin. And, and I imagine that I, he, he reaches out to me from beyond the grave um, in this poem. Crush. Is it literary radical Pushkin that pulls me past Victorian commonplaces Blushing girls, blouses back buttoned from waist to hairline, lust bottled with hyacinth and honeysuckle? Or is it your ubiquity on these Moscow streets, the gaze of your sculpted eye, a hand on my shoulder as I stroll? Your whispered words stirred me before I viewed Kiprensky's portrait of you in the Tretrakov, halo of curls, clear hazel eyes, expression of alert concern, as if for me. Now with this museum guard chirping in my face, she must resent the way I bat my eyes at the bust of you. I see how far I've fallen. I use my own poems to fan heat rising in my thighs when I see the columnar strength of your penmanship. Cross outs of words, phrases, lines, entire stanzas dizzy me. If I close my eyes and touch the glass, I smell ink and vellum sweat on your brow. These words I didn't recognize at first, the P's pronounced as R's, B's as V's, consonants long dripping songs from strangers' lips. After studying silhouettes of men in derbies and top hats, frock coats and trousers, sketched in margins, I swoon. Would you still thrill to see illuminated copies of poems passed from hand to hand? Darling, each day Russians resurrect you in calcs you created to expand the language. By the time I see your death mask, I'm one of the women in ballroom gowns whose elegant necks you outline. And I recall us dancing a quadrille, exchanging pleasantries at first, then remembering the Decemberist revolt. Your bronze arm across my shoulder flexes. Do you recognize me? I must have felt your temper flare when I heard of Natalia's affair, must have felt the bullet pierce when I heard of the duel, for even this simple proximity to your pen makes me wistful for exile, makes me curl up at your feet and write until I sleep. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Christine. Hi, everybody. That was Christine Stewart, the Poet Laureate of South Dakota, and just fabulous. What a great way to start the day. Good morning, everybody. I am Brian Bondi. I am a consultant who worked with nonprofit organizations and arts organizations. I'm based out of Sioux Falls and uh, sometimes out of Rochford, if I'm out west. Um, 
Uh, I want to say thanks to everybody. It's a great morning. I've got my coffee cup full and ready to go. I hope you do too. And I want to say thanks to uh, South Dakota Arts Council and Arts South Dakota for a great conference so far, and especially to our tech team. You don't see all the stuff that we do scrambling back behind the stage to get everything going, but they're doing a great job. Um, I'm excited. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a theater artist and a musician, and but I also sit on a few boards. I sit on the Arts South Dakota board and I sit on the South Dakota Arts Council. And I'm pleased this morning because I'm also on the board of Arts Midwest and I get to introduce somebody who I respect and I think is a great friend. It's been almost two years since I met Tori. And I remember when, when we were exploring who was gonna be the next leader for Arts Midwest. And, and I, I asked around in the music world in the, in the arts world and in the fundraising world and everybody seemed to know Tori Allen and a wonderful guy who holds degrees from UCLA and the Boston Conservancy. He's a, a national art strategy chief executive from Harvard, University of Michigan and University of Texas at Austin, been in leadership with uh, the National Patrons Council at Americans for the Arts, artistic director for the Anchorage Opera in leadership at Alaska Public Media, Oregon Shakespeare Festival, and in 2019 became the new president and CEO of Arts Midwest. But even more than that, he's one of us. He's a performer. He is a internationally known opera singer and it is with great honor that I turn it over this morning to Tori Allen. You're gonna have a great morning with Tori. Well, thank you very much, Brian. I appreciate that. And good morning, everybody. I, uh, I've always dreamed of being in South Dakota. I never imagined it would be like this, but uh, this is just fantastic. Um, I would like to start my time with you today uh, with what may seem like a, a weird question, but uh, later on I'll circle back and hopefully it'll all make a wee bit more sense then. Uh, I I've always been intrigued with the concept of the Holy Grail, the centuries long quest for a miraculous chalice with the power to heal all wounds and provide immeasurable sustenance and joy. I've lived with this fascination since I was a child. So here's the question. What if the grail isn't a physical object? What if it's a, what if it's a state of being? And what if we, every human on this planet has the grail within them? What if it's a spirit or set of spirits like creativity, gratitude, oneness, and love that are pre-coded in our DNA. And finding the grail is more about intensifying the exploration within as opposed to hunting around the world for some object outside of ourselves. Now I'll slightly rest this question on the back burner for a while. Uh, when the good folks at the South Dakota Arts Council invited me here today to speak about a real hot topic these days, namely equity, diversity, and inclusion, my first response was, well, um, I don't know if I'm qualified to speak on this subject. I'm not sure if my training in this area is deep enough to impart any meaningful ideas. But then I thought about the one, one of the biggest lessons I learned as a performing artist, and that is your personal truth has meaning. So I accepted the offer to speak on the subject through my personal lived truth. Hence, that's why I felt it was okay to start off with a weird question because asking crazy questions is part of my truth. So here's a brief outline of what I'd like to do. Um, I'd like to share a little bit about my lived experiences as a person of color. Uh, two, talk about how my background influences the way Arts Midwest is now showing up in the equity space, especially since the death of George Floyd and the civil unrest across our country this past summer. And finally, I'd like to offer three things you can do to step in the, into the equity space in, in a way that I believe is meaningful. My very first experience as a participant in the performing arts was as a child portraying Dr. Martin Luther King in an elementary school student variety show. I was in second grade. My father drafted for me a reduced version of Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech. My mother took on costume do duties and sewed a little robe for me to wear. And I remember practicing the speech with my parents. A few parts of that speech left a very deep impression in my little psyche. You may know them. I have a dream that one day we will live in a nation where people will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And I have a dream that one day little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and little white girls as sisters and brothers 
and all of God's children will be able to join hands and sing. I, I took these words seriously. Several popular songs during that time reinforced my commitment to this dream. Hits from the 70s that celebrated unity and coming together. A couple of my favorites include the song Love Trained by a group called the OJs. And the lyrics were, people all over the world, join hands, start a love train, get on board, take the love train. And then there was that fab fabulous tune by the Beatles, Imagine. Imagine all the people living life in peace. During my youth, I clung to these messages, the messages in these songs. They echoed and amplified King's dream and made my heart sing. Now, at the same time, my personal experience with racism was not unlike many other folk of color. There are so many stories I could share. Like the time when I was a kid riding my bike around a lake near my home and a young white woman and her group of white friends yelled at me, hey, nigger, go back to nigger land. Oh, wow, this was completely unprovoked. I didn't know those folks. I did nothing to instigate that kind of comment. And even at that age, I remember thinking it was especially cowardly for a group of older folk to harass and threaten a young boy on a bike, especially one who was just enjoying the day and minding his own business. There's also the time that as the leader of the opera company, when I was in uh, New York City auditioning singers, often the singers would arrive to the auditions with their agents. And I sensed a lot of the agents and singers were surprised to see me as the person in charge. They appeared to have difficulty understanding that I had the, requ the request requ requisite amount of experience needed to lead a professional opera company. One well-known agent came in. He completely ignored me, and he only spoke with my assisting musical director, who happened to be white. And right there in front of me, he says to my musical director, quote, watch out for these people, unquote, meaning black folk like me. It, it was so shocking that I didn't act then. As I now reflect on that scene, I should have asked him to leave right then. But it was so unbelievably disrespectful and racist, I was just caught off guard. Fortunately, I grew up in a home that encouraged me to see the best in everybody, all people. At home, I was taught to see people who behave in racist ways as victims too. I can still hear my mother saying, a, race, a racist is a victim of one or more three things. And always remember this, they're a victim of insufficient exposure, a victim of insufficient love, or a victim of a mental disorder. And my folks would say, go out into the world and make a difference, but don't let hateful feelings about racism take over your soul. Remember, most people are good. I approach all human relations with this outlook. And all of this informs what I bring to Arts, Midwest, to Arts Midwest in this space. Soon after the murder of George Floyd and the subsequent, subsequent civil unrest in Minneapolis and across our nation, several members of my staff began to insist that Arts Midwest publish a statement about the situation. They were coming from a place of genuine concern and I appreciated their sense of citizenship, but something didn't feel right. I didn't feel we had credibility in this space. We had not established ourselves in local, regional, or national equity discussions. So I reached out to colleagues across the country, from Alaska to Louisiana, from California to Maine, and most of the response confirmed my feeling that a statement wouldn't make much difference. One of the responses still stands out very strongly in my memory. Quote, I do not care about all of these statements of solidarity. People are dying. And these institutions think it's okay to keep doling out meaningless statements without taking any other actions. Language is no substitute for action. It is not okay to use acknowledgement of inequality and suffering as social currency. What, what, what actions are you and your team taking? Unquote. And that really etched something strongly in me. So with all of this in mind, I felt it was important to accelerate Arts Midwest equity journey. Fortunately, Arts Midwest had already launched its work in the equity space before I arrived and was committed to being intentional and acting. We just added a bit more steam. Some of our work includes challenging each department to identify three actions they will make each year to begin shaking up the embedded and sometimes unconscious bias within our organization. For example, our HR department formed a staff equity committee that includes external community members who will be fairly compensated for their time. The committee will help us track, 
understand, and report out on our overall organizational progress annually. Also, we appeal to our major institutional funders for modifications to make our grant funding more equitable for more arts and cultural organizations across the Midwest. And our board established uh, an equity committee and, and take that work very seriously. Our ultimate goal is to build meaningful credibility in the equity space by harnessing the power of the arts to help people and communities across the Midwest love and truly live one of the most beautiful and sublime founding visions of our nation, e pluribus unum, out of many one, out of many one. I believe we can do this. I still hold fast to Dr. King's beautiful dream. For me, it is our nation's dream. And I believe these three things, um, there are three things that every citizen can do to help realize this dream. One, approach equity with sincerity. Racial mythology is deeply ingrained in the American psyche. All of us are victims of this corrupt storytelling. Don't feel the need to pretend to be more woke than you really are. Do what's right and let your heart steer your actions, not the misguided judgment of folks claiming to be woke monitors. Truly understand standing and overriding the impression this mythology has made in our psyches is absolutely necessary and will take time. But and there were and there are many paths on the journey to wokeness. And while your own while your own own your own unique journey, be honest about where you are and bring sincerity into this space. Two, seek context and help others gain context. Put into put effort into learning about the origins of racial mythology. Who started this divisionism? Why did they start it? How has this divisionism, divisionism embedded itself in our lives? What role has the concept of race played in other countries around the world? Share what you learn with others. I lean, to, I lean into context seeking because I believe most people are good. And when they have enough context, they will be empowered to override the racial imprinting in their minds. With enough contextualized understanding, I believe the people of our nation will be able to break the mental chains of racism. And three, take action. Participate in equity discussions and or classes in your community or online. Show up at and support events that recognize folks of color. Actively bring folks of color into your world, hire them, befriend them, and add them to your brainstorming sessions or boards. Read their literature, experience their art. Think of them as your brothers and sisters, your fellow Americans. And most importantly, and this is how we circle back to the beginning, think of all of this as your quest for the grail, not a physical object but the quest for deeper awareness and awakening of the, our powerful inner spirits like oneness, creativity, gratitude, and love. These things that are pre-coded in our DNA. And I believe if we all join this quest, our personal and collective souls and our nation may very well be able to heal our wounds and achieve unimaginable togetherness. Unimaginable togetherness. We can achieve Dr. King's dream. We can achieve the most beautiful founding vision of this country out of many one, out of many one. And together, united together, we can possess the Holy Grail. We can possess the Holy Grail. Thank you for allowing me to be with you today. May the force be with you. Well, thank you, Tori. We appreciate it very much. We all need more exposure and we all want to love so we can be inclusive, help diversity and equity and access. And um, thank you very much for bringing that this morning. I wish all of us could share that with our boards. And I want to thank Arts Midwest for their focus on equity and access. I have learned a lot and I've also discovered my own issues with racism. None of us think we are and we are. And there are things that we need to do. And I think in the art space is a great way to gain exposure so that we can love the way we want to. We are now going live with the drone over racing magpie. So thank you everybody for a great morning.
Hi, uh, I am Peter Strong of Racing Magpie. And I'm Mary Bordeaux of Racing Magpie. And we just uh, wanted to say hi to the South Dakota Arts Conference and welcome you to our space in a virtual format. Um, we're doing our best to, to uh, maintain social distancing and, and keep everyone healthy. So we're, we're doing this by Zoom and uh, just like everybody is, and we're excited to have you here once it's safe. Um, we just, we wanted to talk a little bit about our, what Racing Magpie is and what we do. And I think, I don't know, Mary, do you want to just talk a little about how we came to be just real, real quick? Yeah, so um, I guess I should have said as part of my introduction, I'm an enrolled member um, of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe and have lived um, on the Pine Ridge Reservation um, for almost my whole life. I've been living here in Rapid City now for seven years. Um, and when I moved to Rapid City, I was working for the Heritage Center at Red Cloud Indian School, um, and then went on to work for another institution. Um, but in that time, we, there, I felt this need, or we felt this need and pull to have a space um, for artists to connect and for community to connect and be together. And um, so, you know, that's kind of the really quick <laughs> um, sentence about, you know, racing by pie and, um, but so we um, just, you know, there was a lot of like just happenstances. Um, Peter um, met with just happened to run into the landlords of our building and we were getting ready to um we were looking for space for racing magpie and our hope in the beginning was you know to be a to be able to do um to be consultants and then um to have a native art gallery um that was focused on contemporary modern art i guess you could say um but a space for artists to display art and exhibit it in a way that wasn't confined by um, romanticized views of Native people. And um, and then Peter met the landlords, our landlords, and they had a much bigger space and our ideas about racing magpie started to grow. And um, we included art, we, um, yeah, included artist studios and um, classroom space and um more industrial type space um where you could do like dirtier art is what peter always says but <laughs> and so um that's those louder uh, and dirtier peter. artists right what's that peter those louder and dirtier artists yeah <laughs> the <laughs> most fun ones maybe <laughs> um <laughs> But so that's kind of where Racing Magpie has um, kind of been through in the past um, five years, five and a half years. Um, yeah, thanks. And, and I would just add, you know, now what, what you could have seen before the pandemic hit in March when we shut down to protect our community was we did end up with a contemporary native gallery that we've, we've hung, um, Mary's curated some original exhibits with native artists ranging from painters to um, performance artists and um, we've traveled exhibits around the country um, from starting from our gallery and then we we've had you know up to 20 artists renting um, affordable studios so they're here and they're working we have native and non-native artists in studios and um, really flexible community space. We found that the community has a lot of, especially our Lakota community here in Rapid, had a lot of needs to come together around culture and um, our community let us know what they needed. So we, we really were flexible and worked with them. Um, and now that we've been closed, um, we pivoted very quickly in March and we were able to offer some virtual programming 
um, because artists are still here. You all know <laughs> the artists are here and doing incredible things. And we wanted to figure out a way to just bring some more attention and keep people connected. And uh, so we did these virtual residencies. We've done two rounds of those this summer. Um, what else, Mary? We, we, um, we're starting the um, winter camp yeah. series, um, which is also a virtual event. I think we're, we'll end up having, I think the country will end up having a lot of more virtual events similar to the arts conference um, and our winter camp for the next um, six months or foreseeable future. Um, <laughs> And so we started the winter camp series um, and kind of had there are a little bit longer events um, with different culture bearers and our knowledge carriers. Um, and we've already had, um, maybe Peter, you can elaborate on the folks that we've already had. Yeah, so we started, we kicked off the first kind of the inaugural um, pilot winter of winter camp which the whole goal is for Lakota to create a, a a platform for Lakota people to to share and for those knowledge carriers culture bearers to pass knowledge along during the long cold winter that we have so we had Joseph Marshall the the very famous um writer and um culture bearer. I can't think of all the things that I've seen him do, but he did some really amazing presentations on colonization and the effects on Lakota community culture. Uh, and then in October, <coughs> we had some poetry workshops with Larie and um, John Gozen Center and James Sonovia did a really cool presentation about uh, this, this kind of um, crossroads of traditional knowledge of land or Lakota knowledge of land and place and the world around us and new technologies. So um, GPS and um, LIDAR and all these mapping technologies. So that was really cool. And we're, we're getting close to announcing November's uh, and we'll have those going through the winter all around this idea of building community around arts and culture. They'll be available. They're also available on our YouTube. The yes. residencies are there as well, um, where the artists checked in and, um, yeah. Yep. <laughs> I'm, I appreciate. It. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah, it's all there. It's on Facebook and on YouTube. We also, I think, the last thing I remember is we we partnered with the Cave Collective here in Rapid City, and we put on a six hour live stream. Um, where we featured visual artists and musicians from around the, the Black Hills area. Um, and that that's all online as well. It was really cool. There's so many great people in the community being so creative. So um, that was a fun project and we keep, we're working on more of those. We're, we're we still offer consulting services and um, are just here to, make our hopefully support our community and being better and stronger and um, being connected especially during this time um you know it, it's hard for us all to be a part especially for some of us in community that um, find strength um when we're together and i think it's important that we um do our best to social distance um and so that we can so we're all here at the end of this yeah so um i hope um that this conference is like helped your heart during this time um and helped you feel connected to each other um and that racing my pie will continue with our online presence and virtual presence um to continue supporting each other Thanks, Mary. And, and just, yeah, thank you all for joining. I think you'll get to, to hear from a couple of the artists who are doing amazing things in Racing Magpie, and you'll get to see some visuals of the space. Um, and when this is all, when it's safe, we hope to see you here and um, good luck with everything and take care of yourselves and each other. And uh, I think we'll see you soon. Thanks.
Good morning, everybody from Racing Magpie in Rapid City. Uh, my name is Dwayne Wilcox. I'm, a, I'm an artist here, past recipient of Governor's Awards and here in South Dakota. I've uh, been here at Racing Magpie for like uh, five years since its, since its beginning. And this is the place where I do most of my work. Uh, most of my big stuff comes out of here. I started painting the, the images that you see behind me probably about a year ago. I'm really known for my ledger art from the past and some three-dimensional paper art. Some of you might have seen that in some of the exhibits around South Dakota and either Red Cloud or down at Okta and Chamberlain. Um, I've been an artist for a little over 30 years. I really want to say 35 years, but that makes me sound old. So I don't really want to say that. I'm an enrolled member of the Oglala Lakota people. And uh, I, I grew up and lived in Wombly, South Dakota, in my early years and uh, spent a lot of time traveling around. My wife was career military. So her and I uh, had a nice I guess, tour of duty together. And I was able to take my artwork and do some research on my own in places that we've been to. So I felt like I got some experience out there in the world and came home and, and tried to build my career from home here. And I have had some success. It's been, um, it is what it is. If you're an artist, there's, there's good times, there's bad times but uh, we're all in it for the love of the art, not, not the, uh, I guess the economy is what it is when you're an artist. Other than that, there's um, a lot of venues that are closed this year. So it's an awkward year, I know for everybody, even during this, this, uh, this broadcast today is uh, different for me. So I, I don't have any questions being shot at me or anything, so I'm, I'm just uh, shooting from the hip today. So uh, hopefully I could answer some uh, questions that you might be wondering about me, I guess. Uh, I, I think I pretty much covered it. I, I'm you know a father of two, grandfather of four. So I got that going on. That's kind of exciting. Uh, teach them a little bit what I know about art and uh, try not to be too much of an art teacher or critic. Uh, other than that, it's just... Uh, a lot of Zoom meetings these days. Uh, so, some uh, just, uh, uh, I guess we're all trying to bear through this stuff. So uh, as an artist, you're sitting there, you don't really have a venue to create your work to, to deposit it in. So a lot of it is, uh, you know, online uh, to view your work. So uh, just in the middle of... Oh, yeah. Well, Peter was asking me about inspiration behind some of the work behind me. Uh, I, I, like I said, I, I did a lot of ledger work and uh, basically my ledger palette of colors was basically a breakdown of about 12 different colors. So the uh, paintings behind me, uh, I had a chance to use <laughs> more colors so, and bigger because I was used to working on everything about 11 by 17. These are 40 six by uh, 64 and uh, they're just uh, some of the work that uh, that I've been putting off and I've been wanting to paint for so many years and a lot of it is just a kind of a cubist style but it's not really a cubist style it's just something that I kind of um, uh, I don't know I, I, may, I, I found a place where I don't have to worry about body shapes or sizes or colors or correctness of form. So it was nice to make an abstract of that form. So that's kind of where I wanted to be, where I can kind of go back to where I be the beginning when I first started painting, geez, uh, 30 years ago. But uh, these are a little bit different and I try to use some techniques and trying to build something that might be <clears throat> something that might be exhibitable someplace down the road. And uh, these are basically some of my first pieces. So I see a lot of things that I could have corrected and improved on, but I like to say this is a growing concept. So hopefully they're developed a little bit better down the road somewhere, but uh, 
this is the angle I guess I'm going to try to cut with this this work and uh, continue on trying to trying to develop that a little bit differently. And uh, the pic the pictures I did over this picture over here, <clears throat> it's kind of more or less my ledger style of work. Only thing it's in in a, on a canvas. It's a just a different medium, and it, I like the the flat art that. Uh, that's what drew me to uh, ledger drawings is the flatness, I guess. So I didn't try to put a dimension into it because uh, uh, there's just something uh, that I appreciate about a kind of a folk style of, of work that, uh, that uh, really sticks to me, I guess, uh, from, from some of the earlier ledger stuff. And uh, this is, I think, the first one that I started with the, to, to develop the, everything that followed. This was like the first one of, that I felt like it was worthy of being stretched. Uh, I have a lot of them rolled up that I thought were good. And after I kind of developed a little bit better, I decided that there wasn't as good as I thought. So I'd probably just be painting over them at some point. But it's nice to use a lot of different color. And I just you like the straight color out of the tube. Don't have to mix it or anything. Um, like I said, I'm a self-taught artist, so I don't really have a lot of um, means of, uh, of going into the art school design of uh, what, what things I've done right and what things I've done wrong. I don't think there's any right and wrong in art, but uh, being, you know, self-taught, you kind of have to learn by execution, and sometimes that doesn't develop the way you want it. And uh, thank you for everybody for uh, your ear time and uh, you have a good one. Hey, well, good morning. Uh, uh, my name is John Gosen Center. Uh, this is my little studio here in Racing Magpie. Uh, I'll just give you, come on in, come on in. I'm going to sit down here by my favorite place, which is my workbench. In, sit here by my workbench, but yeah, I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to just to tell a little bit about what I do, but also... Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm John Gosen Center. I'm Oglala Lakota. Uh, in all actuality, all actuality, I was born here in Rapid City. And if I look out the window, just about three blocks or four blocks down the down the street, there is a Founders Park. And Founders Park uh, is a uh, used to be in a little Indian community there in back of the old Mother Butler Center. And, and that's where I was born in 1949. So I was born at home, born along R Rapid Creek. And, but I've had a very eclectic life. You know, I, uh, I don't want to say high tech, but I worked at IBM for many years and founded my own consulting company. But, but I eventually uh, came back to Rapid City. Here I am, uh, full circle. But uh, within my eclectic career, I've always done artwork in the background of what I what I did as a career, but but anyway, now my artwork's in the forefront, and uh, well, I've had some accolades in my uh, in my endeavors as a, a creative. Somehow, I don't like the word artist, but I like the word cr creative. So, but yeah, I've learned. Uh, I've mastered engraving. I don't know if you could really see that that piece there, but that's some of the the engraving I do. This is my engraver machine. It's been rebuilt about four different times, but but I make a dormant. I, I don't like the word jewelry, so I'm always inventing new ways to talk about what people wear, you know. So I call it the art of personal adornment. And as a Lakota, I really look deep within my culture and like to say that I'm doing nothing different than my ancestors did. I, I totally jump back on the creative continuum that my ancestors have always uh, 
uh, traded with, you know, they, they use natural materials. They use things from their, their territory. So what it is I do is uh, my jewelry embodies a lot of the things that uh, are in my culture. Yeah. So shall I wait here or? Oh, okay. Well, yeah, there's, there's guys running around with. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. So a lot of things I create with are from the natural world and how I started out as an early creative. I, uh, I used to dance a lot when, uh, you know, the powwow dances and when I was a young boy. So my origin started with uh, modifying my dance outfit and that led to other things and so within the Lakota paradigm, I've always, you know, kept my work within that paradigm. So, but what I what I do right now is I, I make personal adornment, much in the style of uh, Plains Indian uh, culture, you know. So I, I engrave I engrave special designs that are somewhat reminiscent of the uh, geometric designs my ancestors uh, painted on hides and and such. But I, I have also um, uh, yeah, I do. So, so if you can look right here, I mean, I do have a little display case. So you, you can see some of my silver work. It's it's uh, all that's hand engraved and very reminiscent of things in nature, like lightning. And you can see that as a that's a what I call a spider web. But but these are some of the stones that come from this area, the Fairburn agate. You know, and it's very. Uh, special to this area there's no other place in the world that embodies these kind of agates and so i have right here a lot of my agate jewelry uh there's some of my engraving there's a bracelet there and there's a uh, you know what, what agates look like and you find them in the badlands and the black hills but here i've made a lot of rings uh you know uh it's just a selection of natural stones and some pendants over here but importantly uh I'm going to show here. Uh, well, you can see here. This, this, these are uh, natural stones, and this is an agate that uh, I use. And this is a little diamond saw here, where I slab up uh, nodules from the Black Hills, and inside you can see uh, agate in there. So that that's really what my diamond saw does: is slab up these uh, nodules. And I'll find pieces in them like that with the pattern, and with my uh, with my uh, here you can actually see how I grind and so you can see that that's so, but that's just a, a quick demonstration of of where my where my how I create things and that becomes products like this which are cabochons that are uh, you know these are all from South Dakota western South Dakota you know so that 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 goes into my jewelry so but I'll say I'm probably one of a few artists that actually use utilize the the natural stones in the western part of South Dakota these are the Fairburn agates you know, so that's one thing I can say is my stuff is unique in the sense that I utilize things from the Lakota homeland. So if you just do a pan, you'll see some of my equipment. I have a Durston roller, which I'm really proud of because I can emboss metal. Over here is my engraver. Uh, you can see my wood stump. I've had that for many years where I have some of my tools and also tools hanging up there. Uh, my workbench. <laughs> you know, so, but this is really my, my world. I mean, I, I live here in Rapid City, but I, I come down here every day, you know. Uh, a lot of people don't really know about the, the uh, Lakota uh, jewelry that's been uh, sort of inspired by the Southern Plains jewelers, uh, the Pawnee, the Kiowa, all those, they, they were very instrumental in working and making their style of jewelry, which spun off to the Northern Plains. So I'm just, like I said, jumping back on that continuum to uh, uh, make personal dormant in the paradigm of Plains Indians, you know. Uh, so that, that's about it for what, I, what, I, what I'm doing. 
And uh, you can find me here at Racing Magpie, or I do have a website, www.lakotajewelry.com. So yeah, check it out. And if you see something in there that you like, I do custom work. I, I really, that's not so much I create a lot of inventory to sell. I just do and really relish doing custom work. So I do want to thank you. I think we're all experiencing things very similarly. It's definitely up and down and it swings like a pendulum. And at times I can use that as motivation for me to create some kind of artistic expression. It's creating a chapter in our history. Uh, a lot of things are being realized now, but I think it's also starting to lead us into this future that we always envisioned, but we never probably realized that it was coming so fast. I truly believe changes are good. Like there's a very good side to all the changes that we are experiencing right now because it forces us to be different, to, to not be the same person before. That when we're in this fog of, of feeling like that we can kind of take a step out of it and that's to trust, to move through it. We're called to action as leaders. Again, we see how important artists are. We step up because we bring back that inspiration. We show the world. You know, we create the world, we're doing that in our art form, so we're bringing that back to those who really need it. We'll have kind of a new a new appreciation for how important, what a vital role um, artists and musicians play in that, and they were such a huge part of getting us through this. I'm collaborating with colleagues and, and with strangers who are now uh, acquaintances, and it's incredible to kind of have exposure to what everybody else is doing also, and, and just the amazing kinds of like beautiful music and playing that um, that are happening all over the world. Everybody has a creative energy. We all can create. So, like, if we we, we have to be very careful choosing what what perspective we, we are going to grab on. And then I think we're also starting to break down those um, hierarchies that might have existed, where you can start to let people know that they can be an artist as well too. You don't have to have that title, art with a capital A. You can be a person who's just. Um, needing to be expressive, especially in this really important time. We need the arts now more than ever, at least in my memory. My name is Keith Braveheart. Becky Grismer. I'm Ethan Lin. Jeffrey Paul. I'm Christine Stewart and I write. I sculpt. I play. I paint South Dakota. South Dakota. South Dakota. South Dakota. South Dakota. Welcome back for all of those who have hung with us all three days. We are winding down the 2020 Virtual Arts Conference. It's great to be back with you. I'm Jim Spears with Art South Dakota. And before we get into our last session, I want to just thank a few people once again. Um, our conference leadership committee, who has helped us plan this over the last uh, over a year and a half, almost two years of planning, uh, Sarah Carlson with the South Dakota Arts Council, Daniil Oslin with the Deadwood Mountain Grand, Desi Schoenweiss with the Rapid City Arts Council, Peter Strong at Racing Magpie, Kate Vandell also with the South Dakota Arts Council. And then a special thank you to Pinnacle Productions who has been running all of the tech, running a lot, it did so many details in the background, you wouldn't believe the setup, these guys have been great and uh, we can't wait to work with them again. Thanks to our conference host, uh, Hay Camp Brewing Company and um, Green Ink Designs for our graphic design and layout. Um, special thanks to Dr. Craig Howe and Cairns for the native flashcards and just for his uh, presentation. Um, Dale Lamphere for our dignity materials that you got in your packet. Um, uh, Black Hills Stickers and Bonsai Studio um, and also South Dakota Public Broadcasting for their help. And then uh, certainly, last but not least, <clears throat> our financial sponsors that made this conference possible. We cannot do this without people that are willing to step up and help financially. So a, a big thank you to the <clears throat> excuse me, Bush Foundation, the uh, John T. Vakurovich Foundation, National Endowment for the Arts, 
Bank West, Delta Dental, Security First Bank, Albertson Engineering, Black Hills Energy, Brian D. Haig, Skull Construction, Monument Health, TerraSite Design, 605 Magazine, and, uh, and yes, I, I mentioned South Dakota Public Broadcasting. We have had a great few days, and we have one more presentation, and I'm very honored to introduce this next gentleman here sitting to my left. He really doesn't need an introduction, I don't think, to anybody in South Dakota. He is uh, one of our state's great creative uh, uh, energies, a uh, great artist, um, a wonderful human being, one of the most humble, genuine, um, fantastic people I've had the uh, uh, honor of spending time with. Dale and I have traveled together. Um, we spent some time in Washington, D.C. He and I did all of the sponsor asks last winter together, and it was a joy to uh, stay at his house and um, go to meetings with Dale. He, uh, he's also one of our founding board members of Art South Dakota. And uh, last but not least, he holds the honorable position of Artist Laureate of South Dakota. So please welcome Dale Lamphere. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. Um, it is a great honor to be able to address this conference. And I want to thank all of you for participating in the South Dakota Arts Virtual Conference. Um, this team here has made every effort to keep it informative and entertaining and inspiring. And we want you to know that as the creative edge of our society, we believe what you're doing is tremendously important. I personally came to that realization of the importance of the arts rather slowly over my life. Early on, I went to an experimental program at the University of Wyoming called Nursery School. I believe I was four years old at the time. And I can still remember the day that they brought clay into the room and the way the sun came through the windows and the things that we created. Uh, and that gave me an appreciation later in my life for the importance of early education in the arts and just early education generally and how important that is in shaping our future. Later in high school, I took several years of Latin and I was a terrible Latin student. I mean, the teacher only passed me by her kindness. Uh, but because we had such a dynamic teacher, we hosted the annual Latin Club Banquet every year, and I made armor and swords and chariots, and all of that prepared me for my work later in life. But it also gave me a very deep appreciation for antiquity. And as a student in college, I had the opportunity to go on a shipboard program that still exists now called Semester at Sea, but um, it was the first time that I'd ever really been to a museum, and I went, we went around the world and visited museums all over, all over the world. And I was able to experience firsthand the creations that have been made over time from all these different cultures and how they define the values and characters of each society. And it's inspired me to... Uh, when I came back, it inspired me to go ahead and do the same thing here in my own culture. When we look at antiquity, we realize that we don't really remember any stockbrokers from the days of Rome. Uh, and the few merchants we recall were the ones who supported the arts. What we recall from a society are the expressions of art and literature and architecture and theater and music. These are the things that tell us about the values and character of a society. It's easy to think in this time of COVID that we are just laboring in obscurity. Or you may, as, as I do, think highly of myself. My wife always jokes it's one of my finest qualities. <laughs> but we must believe in ourselves in order to express our visions and share them with the world. We are the author of our own life story. 
you are the person responding in some way through your art form to the values and character of this unique moment in time. You are the person that will inform and nurture and guide us into the future. I know it's easy to think that your contribution is small, but you keep alive that one thing above all else that helps us survive and thrive, and that is creativity. The unique insight that you possess is the spark that my, will light the future and uh, guide us into it, and only you can really express it. You need to keep believing and creating. We need you. As Joseph Campbell said, the privilege of a lifetime is being who you are. So honor your authenticity and carry on. Thank you. Dale, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Really appreciate it. We're asking our teams to come in. Oh, okay. Very good. And you too. Stay right there. Oh, okay. Just sit right I'll there. Just sit right here. Okay. It's been great to be with you all virtually over the last several days. And uh, I know we all wanted to be together. That wasn't possible this year, but we will soon. Someday we will come back together. We know that for sure. And uh, we'll look forward to a conference in person in the future. But we hope you've gained something from this time together, learned something, been inspired, and know that uh, the journey is worth it. And um, I want to say last thank you to the staff at Art South Dakota. Um, they are a, an amazing group of people. Sherry Cosell here, who is uh, the mastermind and has been planning this conference two times now over the last 18 months. And then Andrew Reinartz, um, also on the team of Art South Dakota. We are, uh, we are just so fortunate to have both of those folks working for the arts in this state. And I'd also like to, I'm Patrick Baker, the director of the South Dakota Arts Council. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the South Dakota Arts Council staff, Rebecca Cruz and Sarah Carlson here with us, Kate Vandell with us virtually, Annie Hatch as well. And as we close the 2020 South Dakota Arts Conference, we do want to wish you a happy Halloween uh, with a full moon on the rise, no less. So be careful and be safe out there. We hope that even though this was a virtual conference that you all found an opportunity to not only reconnect with people, but to listen to one another, uh, to talk to one another, um, to learn from one another. And hopefully you were able to take something valuable away from some of the many great presenters that we had and possibly, hopefully, be inspired and even energized with some of the fantastic keynotes that we had. So let's all go forward together and uh, continue to make the world a better and more beautiful place through the arts. Thank you very much. See you in yeah, bye. Goodbye.